you much for the uh, the invitation to be here today. I really appreciate being included in this uh, fantastic course. And uh, it's interesting for me, in, uh, in many ways, the, the idea that we could potentially understand something about the, the neuronal underpinnings underlying consciousness and cognitive functions such as categorization, high-level visual perception, and, and decision-making. This was really one of the, the real motivations for me to get involved in this field in the first place back when I was an undergraduate, um, inspired by you know, the, the work of, of some of the, the folks that are, that are here today and part of this course. So it's uh, fun for me to be here. So what I'm going to do today is tell you, tell you about a series of, of experiments now over the past 10 or, or 15 years now um, in which we've tried to understand something about the neuronal computations and the neuronal mechanisms underlying visual categorization. So just by way of an example here, in, in this rapidly flash sequence of images, uh, you easily and almost automatically recognize many of the images I, I presented up here. For example, if I asked you if, I, if you saw any images of food or, or vehicles, you'd probably say, yes, you did. And you might remember seeing a pizza or a car or something like that. But of course, we're not, uh, we're not born with a built-in library of thousands and thousands of images or, or object categories that were pre-programmed to recognize. Right? You're not born knowing about categories like furniture. Instead, you learn about categories like this through your interactions with the world and, and through, through your experience with the environment. And this is what we're interested in understanding. How, how is it that experience allows the visual system to recognize the behavioral significance of incoming uh, visual stimuli? So this is our, our basic question. Um, and one way of framing this is, how does the brain make categorical decisions about incoming sensory stimuli? And there's lots of examples of this. And one example might be if you're out in the garden and trying to decide um, which, uh, which vegetable to pick, which ve vegetable is ripe enough to, uh, to pick out of the garden. And of course, these uh, tomatoes here can take on a sort of a continue, you know, and it can be anywhere along a continuum of, of colors from green to yellow to red. But at the end of the day, you need to make a binary decision about whether or not you're going to pick a particular piece of fruit. Another example, and actually one that I really like, is uh, this is an example that comes from uh, American Major League Baseball. And uh, what I'm showing you here, is this, each of these points is the position of a baseball as it crossed home plate. And the job of this guy here, the, the umpire, is to make a binary classification of each pitch, of each ball as it comes across the plate. And the, the, the uh, umpire needs to decide if that pitch is a strike, meaning within this spatial region here called the strike zone, or whether that pitch was a ball. And what you're seeing here is evidence of, of a really quite good categorical performance of this individual. So you see there's a relatively sharp category boundary here between ball and strike. Um, and, uh, and, and one point I'd like to make is that this is a, uh, a skill that this individual has uh, was developed over years of experience and years of practice, probably seeing thousands and thousands of pitches, right? The umpire will do this uh, more than 100 times uh, per game. So th this is, I hope, has, th I hope this has some similarities with the questions that, that we're trying to examine in the laboratory. And hope, hopefully some of what I'll tell you about today has some bearing on how uh, this individual might make these kinds of classifications. So the approach that we take to, uh, to study this question is we train monkeys, rhesus monkeys, to uh, learn to group visual stimuli into arbitrary categories. And we then compare neuronal activity across multiple brain areas during visual categorization tasks. And so the, the techniques that we're using is we're recording uh, the patterns of spiking activity. We're recording action potentials from populations of neurons in, uh, in distinct interconnected brain areas that we know are involved in some aspect of the tasks that we're interested in. Some of these areas are more involved in visual processing, others might be more involved in the motor aspects of tasks, and, and others are positioned in between sensory and, and motor areas. And these areas are likely more involved in, in uh, transforming incoming sensory information into appropriate motor responses. So, to, uh, where do we begin to look for signals that might be related to, the, uh, to categorizing incoming sensory stimuli? Uh, 
Well, the first place to consider is perhaps information about categories, information about learned categories might be encoded in the activity patterns of neurons that are relatively early in the visual processing hierarchy. Uh, this is a lateral view of the macaque monkey brain. So this is the, uh, the this is posterior. This is the primary visual cortex here. This is the prefrontal cortex there. So one possibility is that with enough experience and enough practice learning a particular set of categories, visual categories, you might see changes in the uh, visual response properties or the visual or the tuning of neurons in early areas in the visual system, perhaps even as early as the primary visual cortex. On the other hand, it could be that with learning and experience, uh, the representations of basic visual features in primary visual cortex remains quite fixed, and changes or plasticity of visual representations might emerge only later in the, or higher in the visual hierarchy in downstream areas that receive inputs from the primary visual cortex. Uh, but are uh, sort of further along the visual processing pathway. And this could include areas in extrastriate visual areas, V2, V4, and so on, um, areas in posterior parietal cortex, inferior temporal cortex, or, or prefrontal cortex. And we'll touch on several of these areas uh, today in this, in this lecture. So I actually got started thinking about these, this question about visual categorization and plasticity visual representations uh, quite a long time ago when I was a graduate student at MIT in Earl Miller's lab. And at that time, we set out on a project to try to understand um, something about the uh, process of visual shape categorization. And what we did in this study is we used a, a, a 3D image or a 3D shape morphing system to create a large set of smoothly varying visual shape stimuli. And we started with several cat and dog prototypes. And, this, and so what I'm showing you here is one morph line. So you'll see that this cat kind of gradually and smoothly morphs into this dog, right? And what we did over the course of several months of training is we taught several monkeys to categorize this large set of visual stimuli. I'm only showing a very small you know, number of, of the stimuli here. We actually had hundreds and hundreds of different images that we could create from the system. And what we did is we trained the monkeys to categorize this large uh, and smoothly varying set of stimuli into two discrete categories, cats and dogs. And these categories were defined by a learned arbitrary category boundary that the monkeys learned basically by trial and error and based on their reward, um, their, their reward feedback. Um, but basically the animals had to learn this category boundary and report to us whether stimuli were more cat or more dog. And what we found in these studies is uh, we went in and recorded from individual neurons in the lateral prefrontal cortex and the inferior temporal cortex. And so the, the, uh, the prefrontal cortex, as we've heard about a bit uh, today already, is associated with uh, a, a diverse range of cognitive or executive functions, including working memory, um, learning rules, response inhibition, and so on. Um, but it receives inputs from the highest levels of the visual system. And for uh, processing complex visual shapes like these, we know the inferior temporal cortex is a critical processing stage for complex objects. And so we recorded from populations of neurons in these two areas. And what we found is that neurons in prefrontal cortex carried a, a very abstract binary-like signal about what category each uh, visual stimulus belonged to. What I mean is that a neuron would respond strongly and uniformly to all the cats and weakly to all of the dogs, or vice versa, if it was a dog-preferring neuron. The neuron might respond strongly to all the dogs and weakly to all the cats. It was a very binary signal that reflected what the animals had learned over the course of these several months of training. But in inferior temporal cortex, we saw a very different pattern of results. Neurons often responded strongly to these stimuli, but what we found is that neurons did not show these very abstract binary responses to the stimuli. What, what neurons tended to do is they'd have a preferred stimulus. They might pref respond best to one of the cats. And then activity sort of fell off as you moved away from that stimulus in shape space. So basically, inferior temporal cortex was much more concerned about the, the appearance of the objects or the visual features of stimuli, whereas neurons in the prefrontal cortex carried this more abstract signal about uh, the, the category membership of stimuli. So. Uh, in, in more recent years, we've turned our attention to the role of the uh, posterior parietal cortex in this categorization process. And we, we've done this for several reasons. Um, going back about six or, or eight years now, there were a handful of studies that showed that the posterior parietal cortex, which is typically 
associated with visual spatial functions, uh, for example, directing spatial attention or planning eye movements or reaching movements. Uh, at, at this time, uh, several years ago, there was increasing evidence that the parietal cortex was also in, uh, potentially involved in a, a number of non-spatial functions. Um, some evidence that, that there was um, information about the quantity of items that were presented uh, to a subject, um, information about what shape was, was being presented to, to a subject, and, and even uh, contextual information about the rule that the subject had to use to solve a task. So we became interested in, whether the, in, in what the relationship was between uh, activity in the posterior parietal cortex and the uh, kinds of signals we saw in prefrontal cortex and inferior temporal cortex. So the way that we approached this is we, uh, we decided to com uh, compare t two interconnected areas in and around the interparietal sulcus here, uh, visual area MT, the middle temporal area. Uh, for, any, for those of you familiar with the visual system, this is an area that you've probably heard about. It's a, a critical stage for visual motion processing. So, uh, and, uh, for example, monkeys, um, even humans with damage to uh, area MT have profound deficits in visual motion processing. And area MT gets most of its inputs from early sensory areas. For example, visual area V1, primary visual cortex, and area V2. And what you see um, here is that this area here, the lateral interparietal area, area LIP, is directly interconnected with, uh, with the middle temporal area. But it's also inter uh, interconnected with a diverse set of, of other cortical areas involved in a, a range of different kinds of functions. For example, the lateral prefrontal cortex, where we had seen these category signals in the past. Um, LIP also gets inputs from uh, the inferior temporal cortex, visual area V4, areas involved in shape processing. And LIP is also interconnected with areas involved in planning eye movements. So, uh, so LIP has this diverse set of interconnections which, which potentially could support LIP playing uh, sort of parallel roles in different kinds of sensory, cognitive, and motor functions. And, and this is what we're going to discuss a little bit today. So the task that we've used to uh, probe the roles of the middle temporal area, MT, and area LIP during visual categorization is a visual motion categorization task. And we're using visual motion instead of the more complex visual shapes that I showed you before for several reasons. Uh, first of all, it, it, we can argue that we have a better handle on how it is that the brain processes um, basic, uh, basic information about visual direction or, or, or motion direction representations. We have a much better handle on how directional representations are computed in the brain. So this potentially puts us in the position to better understand how such motion rep representations might be transformed by experience into more abstract representations such as uh, categories. So what we train monkeys to do over the course of several weeks is to group 360 degrees of motion directions depicted by these 12 arrows here. The monkeys were trained to group these directions into two categories that were divided by a learned category boundary, which is uh, depicted by this yellow line here. So basically the way this works is that uh, over, over hundreds and, or thousands of trials of training, really over several weeks, what the monkeys learned to do is to treat all of these directions, shown here in red on this slide, the monkey has to treat all these directions as the same. They belong to the same category. They are basically equivalent from the standpoint of the animal. Likewise, all of these directions shown in blue, these are all the same. And, and the, the monkey has to treat them the same. But the monkey has to discriminate between directions that are on different sides of this category boundary. Now, a, a nice advantage of this is that the monkey uh, needs to report that these two directions are different, even though they're visually very similar. Likewise, these two directions are visually very different, but the monkey has to say or report that they're the same. So uh, this allows us to distinguish between signals related to the direction of motion from signals related to the category of these motion directions. And the stimuli themselves look something like this. They were high contrast, 100% um, coherent random dot patterns. Now, the task that we've been using to uh, probe uh, the representation of these stimuli in different areas is called a, a delayed match to category task. Now, the task is a bit complicated, but it, it's basically the same, the same paradigm is going to be used in all of the studies I'll tell you about today. So, um, so this is, uh, it, it's, and, and I'll explain why we've gone to the trouble of using this more complex task. So 
uh, in this task, a, a, a sample stimulus is presented here, at, with usually within the receptive field of a neuron that we're recording from. Uh, a sample stimulus can be any one of, in this case, 12 directions of motion directions. So it, the, the sample can be any one of these 12 directions of motion. So the sample could belong to either of the two categories. So after the sample presentation, there's a, a one second memory delay. And after the delay, a test stimulus is presented. And again, the test can be any one of these 12 directions. So it can be in either of the two categories. And what the monkey has to do is the monkey has to report whether the, the category of the test matches the category of the sample. So the monkey is making a match, non-match decision, a category match or category non-match decision. If the category of the test matches the sample, the monkey has to release a lever with his hand. If the category of the test does not match the sample, the monkey keeps holding the lever until a second uh, test stimulus appears here, and this will always be a match. So the reason that we use this task is because we want to be able to dissociate any signals related to category from signals related to preparation of the motor response. Um, and and uh, because we, we already knew from our, uh, our studies up in prefrontal cortex that there were representations of categories there that were independent of the kind of response that the monkeys used to signal those categories. So any information or any encoding of, of, uh, of categories or direction that we see prior to the test stimulus, for example, during the sample or delay period, we know those signals have to be related to processing the sample stimulus or the sample category, because, and those signals can't be related to uh, to uh, planning different motor responses, since the monkey can't plan uh, the appropriate motor response until the test stimulus appears on the screen. So after the monkeys are trained, their performance is quite good on this task. So for the vast majority of, of, uh, of the directions that we tested, for example, directions that were 45 or 75 degrees from the category boundaries, that's all of these directions here and all of these, the monkey is performing at better than 90% correct. And when you get closer to the boundary, not surprisingly, uh, performance um, decreases somewhat. And what you'll see the monkey's at about 75% for directions that are only 15 degrees from the category boundary. So this, is, this, this performance is, is quite good. It's actually nice that we have some error trials here. Um, this is uh, something that we've looked at. I'll actually touch on this later in the talk. OK, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the response patterns of neurons in, in uh, for now, two uh, areas, uh, area MT and area LIP. So first, I'll show you um, the responses of several MT neurons. Remember, MT is this area that's, um, that's kind of centrally involved in visual motion processing and, and motion perception. So the, in this slide here, what you see on the y-axis, this is fi the firing rate of this neuron in spikes per second. And this is time relative to the onset of the sample stimulus. So that motion pattern, the sample stimulus turns on here at zero and it's on for 650 milliseconds. This is the one second memory delay where the monkey just has to remember what, what category had been presented previously in the trial. And the monkey and the test stimulus is presented out here and he has to, animal has to make his match non-match decision out here. So what you see is that this neuron responds strongly to many of the directions of motion. Right? You see um, you know, this, this particular direction elicited a very strong response from this neuron. This direction elicited a, a very weak response. But there's nothing obviously categorical about the response of this neuron, because notice all the red and blue traces are all jumbled together. And you can actually understand what this uh, neuron is tuned for if you look at this tuning curve. This neuron responds best to directions at around zero degrees, and the responses of this neuron just fall off as you move away from the preferred direction. So this is classic um, direction tuning, very similar to what's been observed in area MT for decades, even in anesthetized animals, you know, obviously not performing any kind of task. Here's another uh, neuron from area MT. Again, this neuron's direction tuned. This neuron has a preferred direction around 240 degrees, and again, a, sh a sharp drop off in activity as you move away from the preferred direction. And we recorded from something close to an 80 or 90 neurons in MT, and what we found is we just did not, didn't see any signals that were clearly related to the animal's um, categorization of these stimuli. So remember, the animals are treating all the directions in one category as the same and differentiating from all the directions in the other category. But neurons in MT did not show these binary-like classifications of stimuli. They were just direction-tuned. And we saw a uniform distribution of preferred directions um, across the population. Now, we saw a very, very different pattern of results in the lateral interparietal area, area LIP. And an example of an LIP neuron is, is uh, shown here. Um, so what you see is that this neuron also responds strongly to many of the directions of motion, but during the late sample period, and particularly during the delay period, this neuron shows a strong binary-like encoding 
of these 12 motion directions. And this neuron basically classifies stimuli as either belonging to category one or category two. In fact, if we try to read out what category the monkey had been presented with during the sample period from the activity of this neuron, we can do so with a reliability that approaches the performance level of the animal, about 90% correct. So you know, the key feature here is that this neuron responds with a very, very similar firing rate to all the directions in the preferred category and differentiates very sharply between directions in the non-preferred category. So one of the key questions that we're interested in and what we're, we're trying to address in my laboratory at the University of Chicago is how is direction tuning, like I just showed you in area MT, transformed into these more abstract signals about category in area LIP. So one of the possibilities, as I mentioned in the beginning of the talk, you know, we had observed these category signals for visual shapes during that cat-dog task in the prefrontal cortex. And we know that LIP is interconnected with the prefrontal cortex. So it, it had been suggested um, that perhaps category signals in the parietal cortex might just be reflecting feedback from the prefrontal cortex. Maybe the, the prefrontal cortex is where these category signals originate and that, um, and that LIP is the recipient of, of that uh, processed category information. So uh, we set out to address this possibility. This is Sruti Swaminathan, a terrific graduate student in the lab. And uh, what she did is directly compared the, um, the patterns of uh, direction and category encoding in prefrontal cortex and LIP in the same animals uh, sometimes simultaneously as the animals performed the same categorization task that I just described. So the, the goal here is to ask whether there are any differences in the strength or timing of category effects in the two areas that might give us clues about um, how these categories are being processed and the relative roles of these two areas. So uh, the first thing that we noticed is that when we just looked at the number of neurons that uh, carried some kind of category signal using a very simple statistical test, just a t-test comparing average firing to category one versus category two, we saw that a relatively large fraction of neurons in area LIP were category selective. You know, uh, over half of neurons in the sample and delay period were category selective. In the prefrontal cortex, it was a much smaller fraction, about 20% of neurons. So category signals were actually quite common and quite prevalent across the population in LIP. And I'll show you just some examples of category selective neurons from the two areas here. So these are two examples of category selective LIP neurons. Um, and what you'll, and here I'll just put up uh, two examples of category selective prefrontal cortex neurons. So all four of these neurons show this same kind of familiar category effect that I described before. Neurons are showing a uniformly stronger response to directions in one category and weaker responses to directions in the other category. But you might, be, uh, you might notice already that there are some differences between these examples that I'm showing you. So both of these uh, LIP neurons show strong responses as soon as the stimulus is presented. Remember, the stimulus is presented here at zero. So within 100 milliseconds or so, these neurons are showing a strong response. And category information is, a, is emerging relatively early in that response. In both of these prefrontal cortex neurons, they, they do start responding somewhat earlier, but or somewhat early. But you do what they tend to show is a gradual ramping up of firing rate and a gradual ramping up of category selectivity as the trial progresses. And actually, information is peaking here um, around the end of the delay period, right? Which is more than a second after the stimulus was at, was presented initially. So we wanted to, to characterize or or, uh, or examine the strength and time course of category signals in more detail. The way we did this is with a um, an R receiver operating characteristic analysis, an ROC analysis. And basically what this does is it, it gives us the statistical measure of the strength of category signals um, in each neuron uh, in our population. And we can then you know, create an average and just look at the average strength and time course of category selectivity across the LIP population and across the, the prefrontal cortex population. And what you see here is uh, so strength of category selectivity is shown here on the, the y-axis. And uh, again, zero is when the stimulus turns on and so this is sample period delay and test. This is the time, strength and time course of uh, category signals in LIP. And what you see is um, immediately after this, the stimulus is turned on, there's an increase in the amount of category information and, and category information persists across the delay period until the animal needs to use that remembered information to classify the test. 
Now, this is the time course of information in prefrontal cortex. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that uh, category information is uh, significantly weaker in prefrontal cortex. But also notice that category signals don't appear in, across the prefrontal cortex population until a bit later. Actually, on average, um, category signals show up in prefrontal cortex about 70 milliseconds later than, uh, than we see them in LIP. And we, uh, we, we wanted to quantify this difference in latency in more detail. And, uh, and maybe I won't go into all the details of this analysis, but basically we asked um, for each neuron, when did uh, category information exceed that that we see during the, the baseline period by uh, three standard deviations for several consecutive time epochs. And what we found is, as I mentioned, the, uh, many, many LIP neurons first become category selective very early in the sample period, within the first one or 200 milliseconds, uh, where, while there's a, sort of a, a broader distribution in prefrontal cortex and, and a sig significant difference in mean between the two areas. And we conducted a number of important controls to make sure that the difference in latency that we're seeing between the two areas were not related to, uh, to a number of potentially confounding factors. Um, for, and one thing we were worried about is uh, we wanted to make sure there were no differences in behavioral performance during our prefrontal cortex recordings and our LIP recordings. And uh, we went in and, and confirmed that the animals had uh, statistically identical accuracy and reaction times during frontal and parietal recordings. We also interleave recordings, uh, neuronal recordings, from the two areas. So we would record from LIP for several days, then prefrontal cortex, then LIP, so that any long-term trends, for example, just m maybe more, more training might lead to stronger or earlier category effects. We were able to rule this out since we interleave the recordings. We also, uh, we also determined that the difference in latency between the two areas couldn't be explained by just the differences in the strength of category selectivity or firing rates between the two areas. And we did this using several techniques. And uh, very similar latency results were, were obtained using other analysis methods, for example, using a category selectivity index rather than the ROC analysis that I mentioned. So the, the, the takeaway message then is that both frontal and parietal neurons encoded the learned categories, but evidence suggests that LIP may be more strongly involved in category encoding during this task. And the reasons for this is that compared to prefrontal cortex, LIP had a greater fraction of category selective neurons. LIP showed stronger category selectivity, and LIP also showed category selectivity with a shorter latency. So this leaves open the possibility that LIP may, in fact, be a source for category signals in prefrontal cortex and, and other areas. So Sruthi then went on to ask another question, which was, well, how does the activity in LIP and prefrontal cortex relate to the monkey's trial-by-trial -trial decisions about category membership? And this relates a little bit to, remember I, I, uh, I mentioned that there were some error trials when the animals make mistakes, when they might misclassify a stimulus. So we can ask whether we can explain the monkey's errors uh, according to the uh, neural activity of neurons in each area. But we didn't have too many error trials to work with, so uh, Sruthi went on and added an, uh, some new conditions to her experiment. And what she did is she presented the animals with stimuli that were right on the category boundary. So their directions were right in line with the, uh, with the learned boundary. And there's basically no right answer, right? So trial by trial, the animal would report that this direction sometimes belongs to category one, sometimes it belongs to category two. And sure enough, when we looked at the animal's performance, we found that the animals were basically performing right at, right at chance for these you know, ambiguous, we'll call them, uh, category directions. So the monkeys are, are basically going back and forth, calling these directions category one sometimes, category two, and other, uh, other trials. So what we can now do is go look at neurons that we uh, recorded on these conditions and ask whether neural activity reflects the animal's trial-by-trial -trial decisions about the category membership of these ambiguous, um, the ambiguous directions. And this is an, an example of one prefrontal cortex neuron. This is one LIP neuron. And uh, the way these plots work is that these pale traces, the pale red traces and pale blue traces, that shows what these neurons are doing on the non-ambiguous trials. This is actually a neuron that I showed you already. This is one of the ones from an earlier slide. And what these dark traces show is this is the, uh, this is the firing rate when the animal reports that the ambiguous directions belong to the red category. 
this is the firing rate when the monkey reports that the ambiguous direction belongs to the blue category. So notice that there's a significant firing rate difference depending on the report of the animal uh, about the category membership of these, you know, they're the same directions trial by trial. It's just what's changing is the animal's classification. And, uh, and this is an LIP neuron showing a similar effect. The neuron shows stronger activity when the animal reports that the ambiguous directions belong to the blue category, weaker activity when the animal reports that they belong to the red category. But these are just two single neuron examples. So what's going on across the population? Well, it turns out that if, you know, if we went through and looked at all of the different neurons that we recorded from, I can show you lots of examples of LIP neurons that, where the firing rates reflect the animal's trial by trial choices. Uh, such neurons are, like this one are actually fewer and farther between in prefrontal cortex. So I, th I don't have really too many more to show you. And, and this, this shows up in this population analysis, which allows us to measure the strength of category selectivity for the ambiguous directions um, in LIP and prefrontal cortex. And the, the upshot of this is that across the population, we see much stronger choice probabilities or much stronger uh, effects of um, of, of a much stronger category effects for the ambiguous directions in LIP than prefrontal cortex. So this is further evidence then that uh, LIP is potentially more involved in solving this categorization task than the prefrontal cortex. So I want to, uh, in the last few minutes, I want to tell you about um, one more uh, one more experiment. So what we want to know is what's the relationship between these category signals in LIP and LIP's well-known role in spatial processing and spatial functions, right? So LIP's been studied for, for decades now, often in the context of visual spatial attention or planning eye movements. And, and, and these spatial effects in LIP are strong and robust, and we want to understand what the relationship is between these spatial signals and category signals. And what I mean by spatial signals, so one of the classic tests for LIP, in fact, when we're recording from LIP and or when we're recording from parietal cortex, we want to confirm that this neuron is indeed an LIP neuron, we have the animals perform a memory-guided uh, delayed saccade task. And it's a very simple task. The animal just fixates on a point in the center of the screen, and we flash a target somewhere in the periphery, and the animal has to make a saccade, a, a rapid eye movement, to the remembered location of that flash target. And what we find is that when, for an example neuron like this one, when the target is flashed in this part of the screen here, the neuron res uh, responds very strongly. If you flash a target somewhere else, we don't have much of a response. So neurons show very strong spatial tuning. And, but what I want to point out is that neurons like, like this one, they show a strong visual response. That's this red portion of the curve. That's when the stimulus is actually visible on the screen. But after the stimulus turns off, this green portion of the curve, this neuron just keeps responding, or it keeps firing for up to several seconds, which is related to, you know, one, one or more processes such as uh, directing spatial attention to this location on the screen, um, maintaining a, a, a memory, a, a memory trace of the, of the location of that flash target, or, or in uh, pre uh, preparing the eye movement itself. But it turns out that, you know, almost every neuron we recorded from in LIP, we also tested with this delayed memory saccade task. And most, if not all, of these neurons show spatial selectivity during this task. So basically, neurons that show this kind of category selectivity also show uh, spatial selectivity like this. So we want to understand the, the relationship between these, these two signals, because this is inherently a non-spatial signal, right? Because the stimulus is always presented in the same location. The monkey's not making a spatial response. He's just releasing a lever with his hand. So the way that we examine this is, is uh, Chris Rischel, a, a, another terrific grad student in the lab, he set out to compare saccade-related activity and category-related activity in LIP. The way he did this is start, he started with our standard categorization task, just like what I described already. So sample period, delay period, and a test. And the animal, again, has to make his response uh, with his hand about whether the test matches the sample. But Chris added an, an additional twist to this task, where uh, we required the animal to make an eye movement, to make a saccade, in, at the beginning of the delay period. So just after the sample turned off, we just simply moved the fixation spot from the center of the screen to the, lo to the location of the receptive field in this condition, or we moved the fixation point away from the receptive field in this condition. And then what this, uh, the requirement is that the animal needs to make an eye, a rapid eye movement to reacquire fixation at this new location, and then just complete the trial then he'll just have to wait for the delay, wait for the test stimulus to come up, and then release the lever. So 
from the standpoint of the monkey, he still has to do exactly the same categorization task. There's just a little eye movement um, in the beginning of the delay period. But everything we know about LIP tells us we should see a large uh, neuronal response when the animal makes an eye movement toward the receptive field of the neuron we're recording from, and maybe some suppression when the animal saccades away from the response. And so the question is then, can we understand something about the relationship between spatial signals related to the eye movement and these category signals we expect to see during the, uh, during the delay period of the categorization task? So what I'll start by is just showing you the average profile of neural activity across the trial. This is in our standard condition with no saccades. This is just like the data I showed you before. And what you see is that neurons respond. This is across the whole population we recorded from. Neurons respond strongly at the beginning of the sample period, and firing is maintained across the memory delay period. And this is when there's no saccade. This is what happens when the animals make a saccade toward the response field of the neuron we're recording from. So the sample turns on, the delay starts, but then you see a strong response when the animal makes that saccade toward the receptive field. And then we see some persistent firing, and, and the animal completes the trial out here. And this is what happens when the animal saccades away from the receptive field. So you see quite a bit of suppression of neural activity around the time of the eye movement in the non-preferred direction. So the question then is, does this neural response, especially here, does this somehow interfere in the uh, parietal neuron's ability to maintain these category signals throughout the rest of the delay? So basically, one way of framing this is, do these spatial signals, are, are the non-spatial category signals robust in the face of these large spatial modulations? So we'll start just by showing you a single neuron here. So this, uh, this is a neuron showing our familiar category effect, right? This neuron responds more strongly to directions in the blue category, more weakly to directions in the red category, and that selectivity is maintained across the delay. And there's no saccade in this condition. But this is when the animal saccades toward the receptive field of the LIP neuron. And you see this category signal just kind of rides right on top this, of this large spatial saccade-related signal. And category information persists in the post-saccadic delay. So, um, and, and then I can show you also what happens when the animal saccades away from the receptive field. Again, uh, category information is maintained across the eye movement. So this suggests that these category signals and spatial signals are relatively independent, at least for this, uh, for this particular neuron. Um, this is a second neuron. Maybe I'll just skip this in the interest of time. Um, so, but a question was, well, is there any impact on the strength of category selectivity? Does, this, does the saccade impact um, category signals in any way. Um, and so we applied the same uh, ROC-based analysis to read out the strength of category signals across the trial. This is what we see in the no saccade condition. So just like before, we see an increase in category signals that are, uh, and that information is maintained across the trial. But this is the condition where the animal makes a saccade toward the response field. And remember, the saccade's happening right here. There's a really, there's a large response across the population. Um, right at this period of time. But from a readout perspective, the ROC analysis shows us that we can read out category information from the population with the same fidelity, even during the eye movement itself, as we can in the no saccade condition shown in green. Likewise, when the animal saccades away from the, the response field, and you see that suppression of activity, we can record signals, just, we can record this, uh, or decode this category information just as well. So what this suggests then is that category encoding in LIP is minimally influenced by strong saccade-related neuronal responses. And spatial and abstract or cognitive non-spatial signals um, appear to be independently represented and multiplexed by individual LIP neurons. So just to summarize what I've told you about today, um, posterior parietal neurons in area LIP reflect the learned category membership of visual motion stimuli. Uh, these category signals were not uh, observed earlier in the visual system, back in the uh, middle temporal area, a key motion processing area that is interconnected with LIP. Category selectivity in LIP was stronger and uh, more reliable than PFC, and it appeared with a shorter latency. And LIP category signals are encoded independently of spatial signals related to saccadic eye movements. So, Kind of putting this all together, it suggests that parietal cortex may play a more general role in encoding the non-spatial behavioral significance of stimuli in parallel with its well-known role in spatial processing. And so just to give you a sense for where some of this work is going, uh, still one of the, the big questions for us is to try to understand this transformation, how signals that are uh, related to direction processing or, or motion processing in, for example, area MT, how are those signals converted 
and transformed into more abstract signals about the behavioral significance of stimuli, like those that we see in parietal cortex. And so uh, this is something we'll be working on in addition to, to, in addition to trying to understand what is going on during the learning process itself. When the animals are actually first acquiring these categories, we'd, we'd like to understand what's, what's changing and, and what, are, what, are the relevant, um, what are the relevant processing stages for, uh, for the development of these categories during learning. And I uh, just want to wrap up by thanking everyone who uh, made this work possible. This is Sruthi, who did the, the work comparing uh, prefrontal cortex and LIP. And this is Chris, who did the work looking at the relationship between category and saccade activity. And uh, thank you again for the invitation.